Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much um, for joining us this afternoon. We are here talking to Stephen Kelly, who's the Managing Director of Ability Focus. And just before we get started, my name is Chris Belfini. I'm the Director of Employers for Change, which is an employer disability information service. I myself am a white female with blonde hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a dark copper top with a purple virtual background behind me and a white Employers for Change logo. Uh, some of you might have already attended virtually some of the Employers for Change events um, and we're absolutely delighted this afternoon to have Stephen Kelly here with us. Stephen has over 15 years of experience both in recruitment um, and also in disability services. He previously worked as a recruitment consultant and then for a number of years worked with Employability, which is a national uh, supported employment service for people with disabilities. So he has a wealth of knowledge that he's going to share with us this afternoon and he's going to be focusing on disability in the recruitment process as well. So that would be really, really interesting for us all to hear from him. So without further ado, Stephen, I'm going to pass over to you. So welcome everyone and thanks Christabel. Just to follow in your lead as well, I'm a, I'm a white male, blue eyes, brown hair. I have a brown beard with a fairly heavy tints of ginger throughout and a lot more grey at the front, I think, than I'd like to admit. Um, I'm wearing a white shirt, I have navy slacks on, and I'm coming to you today from my office, which has a white wall behind me there with a shelf with various personal and work-related items on the shelves. So welcome everyone to Disability Awareness, this seminar on disability awareness and inclusive recruitment with Employers for Change and Ability Focus. As Christabel said, my name is Stephen Kelly, and I'm a disability inclusion specialist and the managing director of Ability Focus. And just so you know, at Ability Focus, what we primarily do is deliver disability awareness training to organizations in the public and the private sectors. Um, we do this through live online uh, training programs, just like the one that you're tuning into right now. And prior to the pandemic and hopefully post pandemic, we'll all be back on site again, although I'd say we have a few months yet, just to be sure. Um, I've over 17 years experience working in recruitment, um, supported employment and for people with disabilities and through the employability service. And I work for the regional management team of North Leinster Citizens Information as well. And I've also worked quite a lot in training. And I set up Ability Focus in 2019 with a view to creating a greater levels of awareness around disability in Irish workplaces. So um, as we do in all of our training programs, I'm going to do some very quick points to note before we get properly started. So first of all, the seminar is going to be brought to you today in plain English. So for those of you who don't know, plain English is a movement which is promoted by NALA, which is the National Adult Literacy Agency. And it's a movement away from corporate talk and convoluted speech. When you're delivering training or when you're presenting, people may not have a high standard of English. English may not be their first language or they may have dyslexia or they may have an intellectual disability, for example. So this isn't about dumbing down language. This is just not about using unnecessary language. And it's about creating greater levels of access and access. It's about access for everybody. Um, you're going to see large print plain slide formats. So again, every slide that you see over the course of the next hour or so is exactly like the one that we're looking at right now. It's a large black print, white background and green headings. There's no text heavy slides. You'd see no text over images, no smart art, no animations. And all of your slides should always be as clear and as simple as possible for all audiences. I really do think that far too many presentations and training programs have excessive background imagery on each slide. And this can actually make it extremely difficult for some people with disabilities to see the slide content. And it should always be about your slide content. Again, when you think of people who have visual impairments, for example, this might be especially relevant. You see PWD quite a bit, that's just people with disabilities. And there's going to be a varied knowledge base of participants. You know, when I was, um, when I was formatting this program, I was very aware that there's people tuning in um, who have no knowledge at all really of disability and are very interested in kind of learning about the disability awareness kind of program and recruitment. And then there's people on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. You know, people who are working in employment and disability employment for over 20 or 30 years. So I formatted this with a view to hopefully making it fairly accessible for everybody. So the program is broken into three different sections. So section one is a very brief introduction to disability. And this is where we're going to look at stats and people's perceptions of disability. Section two is the recruitment process. And we're going to look at steps to ensuring a recruitment process inclusive of people with disabilities. And then section three, we're going to look at creating an, an inclusive organization. But before we look at any of this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna veer a little bit off topic here and I'm actually gonna show you a thing called the medical and the social model of disability. So what is the medical model of disability? Well, the medical model states that people are disabled by a physical, mental health, sensory or other impairment that they themselves have. 
you know, the medical model says that you can be fixed or you can be changed by medicine or surgery. It's your impairment which disables you. And it ultimately looks at what is wrong with somebody and not at what they need. And then in the 1960s or in the 1970s or in the United, uh, United Kingdom, there's a bunch of people and they say, look, we, we do have impairments of that, there is no doubt. But we feel that what disables us is the lack of access, the lack of support, and ultimately how society functions. That is what disables us. And they came up with a thing called the social model of disability. So what is the social model of disability? Well, the social model states that a person is disabled by the way society is organized and not due to any impairment that they themselves have. The social model, it looks at removing barriers and changing attitudes. And in the social model, disability, it's used to refer to restrictions which are caused by society when it doesn't give equivalent attention to the needs of people with impairments. And I really think that's why we're all here today. We're here to look at a process which all too often doesn't give equivalent attention to the needs of people with impairments. It's a recruitment process. I really do think that how we recruit is one of the main disabling factors in the lives of so many job seekers with disabilities and impairments. And hopefully today what we can do is create some bit of a more equitable playing field for those who are job seeking. So we're going to look now at a quick introduction to disability before moving on to section two, which is the actual recruitment process. So I'm a big believer in, um, in stats. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at about five or six points here relating to disability in Ireland and the 643,141 people in Ireland living with a recognised disability. That's 13.5% of the Irish population or one person in seven. So figures are steadily increasing with an 8% increase on the 2011 census. And it's expected that that will increase by at least another 8% for the 2022 census next year. So there's probably a lot closer to around 690,000 people living in Ireland with a recognized disability. 70% of people who have a disability at working age acquire their disability when they're at that working age between the ages of 16 to 64. So, you know, the vast majority who have a disability at working age they, they weren't born with that disability. They acquired it when they were at a working age. So there's always, there's always going to be people tuning in who say, you know, these stats ultimately aren't relevant to me right now, but it will become relevant to you or to somebody close to you at some stage over the course of your lifetime. You know, another point to note is disability, it's the only minority group in the world that you can join overnight. You know, you can't, you can't change gender overnight. You can't become black or Asian or Hispanic overnight. You can't become a member of the LGBTQ uh, plus, Q plus group or a member of the Irish traveling community. But you can acquire a disability overnight. And undoubtedly, anybody here or anybody close to us will acquire a disability at some stage over the course of their lifetimes. Only 6% at pre-pandemic levels, only 6% of the entire Irish workforce had a disability. And Ireland has one of the lowest employment rates for people with disabilities in all of Europe. So the final stat that we're going to look at here is from Eurostat, and this says that there's a higher risk of poverty and social exclusion in Ireland for people with disabilities compared to any nation in Western Europe. So the stats that you're looking at right now on, your, on, your, on the actual slide were compiled in late 2019 by Eurostat. So for those of you who don't know, Eurostat is the statistical institution of the European Union, and it's their job to provide stat to in stats to institutions of the EU. Uh, they measured the percentage of people with disabilities who are at risk of poverty and social exclusion by each member state. And what they actually found was people with disabilities in Ireland fared worse off than, more, than all countries in Western Europe, and in fact, most countries in Eastern Europe included as well. The only countries which actually ranked lower out of 31 countries surveyed for levels of poverty and social exclusion were Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Bulgaria, and then Ireland. Another point to note before we move on is, according to Dr. Joanne McCarthy from the Disability Federation of Ireland, when she wrote an article in the Irish Times um, about two years ago, she said the chances of somebody with a disability living in poverty has actually more than doubled since 2011. So in 2011, there was an 11% chance if you had a disability of living in poverty. By the time we got to 2019, that 11% chance had jumped to 24%. So as Ireland became richer over the last 10 years, as we actually progressed into a nation of wealth once more, you know, when we went from bust to boom, we actually left many people with disabilities behind. Things were actually getting significantly worse at pre-pandemic levels. And what's the key factor in combating poverty and social exclusion? A key factor is employment and employment and employment opportunities. So if we can create greater level of opportunity of employment for people with disabilities by having a more inclusive recruitment process, then we can help address 
this huge state of inequality here in Ireland. So one, one thing I ask in, uh, in all my training programs is, you know, I always put this slide up and ask everyone to take a second and reflect and ask yourself, you know, what, what is disability to you? So when you hear disability mentioned, what's the first thing that you think of? You know, do you think of autism? Do you think creature users? Do you think people who are blind or do you think and recognize how diverse disability actually is? And how do your thoughts towards disability actually influence your reactions and your decisions when you engage a job seeker who has a disability? This is all about, you know, how we perceive disability because we all perceive disability in very different ways. You know, if you're to look at the, uh, the four kind of pictures here, look at the top left hand corner. Some people will always think of accessibility. You know, they think of ramps and curb cuts and website access and belt escalators and push taps and so on. You know, but some people, would you have ever thought that Albert Einstein, you know, the greatest physicist of all time was believed to have had Asperger's? You know, when you watched, uh, when you watched Goodwill Hunting, you know, would you have thought that Will, the main actor in the movie, would you recognize him? Would you have known that he had a disability? And when you think of intellectual disability, for example, do you naturally think of somebody who's just simply not capable of work? Or do you know, like so many of us who've worked in the industry for many years, know that people with intellectual disabilities can be hugely productive members of, of, of companies, providing they're in the right employment with the right employer? Or would you normally have associated all of these people or all of these pictures with disability? Because disability is all of these. And as we're going to see now on the next slide, disability in itself is hugely diverse. So according to the 2016 census, there are seven primary categories which disabilities can actually be broken into. There's intellectual disability and developmental conditions. Now we've actually adapted this from the 2016 census just to suit this kind of program. Um, there's conditions which limit basic physical activities. There's blindness and serious vision impairment. There's mental health issues and mental illnesses. There's deafness or hard of hearing. There's difficulty in learning, remembering, concentrating, and there's chronic pain and breathing and chronic illness. So this is an area when we're delivering our, our, our full or our main training program that we actually spend quite a lot of time on. And I think it's, I really do think it's very important that people are very aware of the level of diversity that exists within disability. So as you can see, there are the seven categories and even within each one of these, there's breakdowns into further variations in disability. You know, far too many people have very, very tunnel views of disability. I was, um, I was at a conference um, last February, an actual real conference, and we could all be in a room together. And, uh, and I was chatting with this, this man and I was explaining about ability focus and what we do and how we work. And he just shook his head. He said, no, he said, I could never have someone with a disability working for me and my, my, my company. He had, a, he had a company, he was the MD of a fairly, fairly well-known company, um, which was in Dublin too. And it was in an old Georgian building. And he said, you know, we, we've got a basement level floor. That's where the kitchen is. And we've steps, four or five steps going into the, the building. And he said, we've stepped, you know, three or four floors. We don't have any lifts. He goes, I, I couldn't have anyone with a disability working for me. Um, he didn't factor in sensory disability. He didn't factor in mental health issues. He didn't factor in other physical impairments where somebody doesn't require wheelchair access. So disability, you know, it's not just wheelchair users and people with obvious physical impairments. Disability is hugely varied. And by knowing of the huge variations, we know that people with disabilities, they're as diverse as those without disabilities and their needs and their talents are not all the same. And even within a category, if you look at, see category two there, such as set conditions which limit basic physical activities, you know, you've got such levels of diversity, cerebral palsy, cystic fibrosis, spina bifida, acquiring injuries, and MS. So, but how many of us, I think outside of those who work directly in the air are aware of exactly how diverse disability is. So I think, you know, when you're looking at our perceptions of disability and how we perceive disability, you know, this is directly related to our levels of bias when we engage job seekers as, as disability, uh, uh, when we engage job seekers who have a disability. So just to finish up here, we're very quickly going to look at conscious and unconscious bias. So what is conscious bias? Well, conscious bias is where you already have a preconceived opinion of a person, such as a disabled person, you act according to that opinion. So, you know, all disabled people in employment, they all need help. Um, people who have Down syndrome, they can't work without constant support. Uh, people who have mental health issues are going to be out, for, out of work for months at a time. Right? These are things that you actively think on an ongoing basis. They're not just flash thoughts. But then you've got unconscious bias. And unconscious bias refers to a bias which happens outside of our control, which is triggered by your brain, making quick judgments and assessments of people and situations. And it's influenced by our background, our cultural environment and our personal experience. It's that kind of that ingrained feeling, you know, things we believe since we were little kids. It's almost like a snap judgment, you know, preferring people with a certain skin color, preferring people from a certain area and not being comfortable engaging somebody with a disability. And both conscious and unconscious bias is actually so, so common for all of those of you tuning in who work within the area. 
I hope you'd agree that it's so common when it comes to those who actually engage disabled people when they are recruiting or when they are job seeking. So I think, you know, whatever beliefs we have relating to disability, whatever conscious and unconscious biases we have, how we perceive disability, that is what we bring when we recruit. That is what we bring to the recruitment process. And that's why I genuinely think that everybody should be doing disability awareness training. Everybody should do this to address your preconceived opinions and to create a more level playing field. So now that we've looked at, a, at an introduction, a very quick introduction to disability and how we kind of perceive disability and we bring our own levels of bias to disability, we're going to move on now to the actual recruitment process itself. So, you know, when we actually look at the report, I was saying this to Christabel before we actually came on, I was saying, you know, when you look at the recruitment process, you, you could really delve in and go, go very deep into this. You, know, you could look at job analysis and job description, descriptions and uh, person profiles and shortlisting, job advertising and all that and so on. But, you know, I think it's more important that we just touch on some of the more relevant areas in, in this fairly short section and hopefully you get a few good takeaways from it. So we're going to look at seven different areas. We're going to look at company culture, job analysis. We're going to look at job description, job advertising, interview stage. We're going to look at starting the new job. And then we're going to finish off by looking at a really important aspect to the recruitment process, which is disclosure. So the first is company culture. And I think, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they think of the recruitment process, they, they naturally go in their heads to like forming a job as a starting point. But inclusive recruitment, it actually starts a long, long way before that. You know, job seekers nowadays, they're, they're nothing like previous generations of job seekers. They're not looking for a long-term job for life. As, as I was saying to somebody over the weekend, they're not like my dad back in the 1970s who got a job with the Ordnance Survey and, you know, it was a job for life in the civil service. You know, times have changed. You know, people are now looking for a company that aligns with their core beliefs, with their core values. And they look for companies that are ultimately reflective of themselves. And people with disabilities, they're, they're no different. So how is your organization perceived by job seekers with a disability? You know, do you portray a culture of inclusivity? Do you demonstrate diversity on your website when you're advertising and, and in how you recruit? Because if a company demonstrates a, a disability inclusive culture, then you're far more likely to get people with disabilities considering you as an employer when they are actually job seeking. So how can you actually show a culture of inclusivity, you know, to job seekers who do have a disability? Well, I'm going to show you, I think it's seven, probably seven points here. So the first one, ensure visual representation of disability on, on your website images. And this is a fairly simple way of showing that you are an inclusive organization. You know, we can't be what we can't see. And if you show people with disabilities working in your organization, you're showing a willing employer. You're showing that you are a willing employer. So again, try to move away from always. I mean, one, one thing I would always say is try to move away from always having the wheelchair as being, you know, the go-to visual representation of disability. You know, maybe include people with prosthetic limbs, for example, you know, diversify it you know, show that you are, uh, that you are all inclusive in that regard. Um, I have a website, which is WCAG21 compliant or WCAG 2.0 compliant at the very least. You know, I, I think all businesses should at least aim to do this. So for those of you who don't know, these are the web content accessibility guidelines. And what it does is it defines, uh, it, it actually defines on how to make the web more accessible for people with disabilities. And again, if you are showing that you are demonstrating efforts to actually be more inclusive in that regard, you're actually including a lot more people with disabilities when they're trying to use your services. Um, have an accessibility statement. You know, this goes at the bottom of your website next to the legal disclaimer and, and the cookies policy, for example. And uh, look, it simply states a best practice commitment to disability inclusion. You know, you might not have the perfect website and that's okay. But by having an accessibility statement, you're showing that you are making efforts to include. And it, it doesn't have to just be about your website accessibility. I think the really good accessibility statements, they have an accessibility statement, which is primarily through website accessibility and best practice, you know, efforts to make it more accessible. But you can also include a commitment to, you know, to, to, to more accessibility when it comes to building access. You know, you can actually mention that what your levels of outside parking are, that you do have a disabled parking space outside and so on and so forth. So website accessibility statements on your websites are a very good level of demonstrating that you are an inclusive organization. Ensure your videos on your website have closed captions. You know, it's, it's, it's been done much, much more and more and more um, over the last year or so, but traditionally it's something that hasn't been done a huge amount. Um, there's 92,000 people in Ireland who are deaf or who are hard of hearing. And if you are promoting your services only by video, and if you don't have closed captioning or subtitles, then if people are deaf and if they can't hear what's being said, then you are excluding them. You know, remember that if you don't include disability, you're excluding it. So it's very important to have closed captions or subtitles in that regard. 
involve disabled staff at the, at the design stage, you know, in your images, in your text, and when it comes to access, you know, so if you have staff members who have a disability, if they're happy to have a conversation, say, you know, what, what do you think we can do to make our organization more inclusive? And they do, in many cases, be able to tell you from their own point of view, what can be improved. You have equality statements um, when advertising roles, and this is something that we're going to spend a few minutes at looking at in, in a few minutes. And you can partner with disability organizations, uh, you know, for mutually beneficial relationships with disability organizations, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, as well as charities, and promote this on your website. Show people when they are looking at your website that, look, you are an inclusive organization, that you are open to disability. So by doing all of these things, you know, a job seeker with a disability, if they come across your company website, and they're, seeing, they're then seeing a company which understands and includes disability. So now that you've demonstrated a culture, I suppose, of inclusivity on your website, you know, what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to forming the actual job analysis. So the job analysis itself, this is the process of gathering information about a job in order to communicate it effectively to job seekers when they are, when you're forming your job description. And it should include six kind of key areas. You've got the core tasks, the essential skills, any physical requirements, the physical working environment, work experience needed to do the job and qualifications. The key thing to remember here is that a job analysis should always be conducted of the job and not of the person who does the job. You know, somebody who has a disability might do the role very differently to somebody who doesn't have a disability. So the key thing to remember here is look at what, what is to be achieved and not how it is to be achieved. You know, I think we've traditionally focused very, very heavily on, on how a job is to be done. You know, not what has to be done. And, you know, I've, I've been getting um, I've been getting emails right now from people at 11 o'clock on, on Sunday nights and six o'clock on Wednesday mornings. And, and many people who are tuning in today, they're tuning in remotely and they're no longer in the office. So, you know, does that job actually have to be done in head office in the IFSC? Do the working hours have to be nine to five? Must that person really have a full clean driver's license? So these are all the things that you should be actually keep taking into consideration. If there are physical requirements, note them. Note them in the job analysis before you go on to actually write your job description. And are specific qualifications, are they absolutely necessary? Or are they just desirable? You know, discuss these things with managers, with the direct line managers, because many people with disabilities, they'll actually have taken alternative routes to employment. So these are all the core aspects to forming a good and relevant job analysis. So once you have all of this relevant information, then you move on to putting together your actual job description. So again, similar to the job description, you know, a good job description, it describes the job and not the person who does the job. You should always concentrate here and again, what has to be achieved, not how it is to be achieved. And you should have measurable actions, which can be clearly judged. And again, you know, can this candidate do this role or not? Keep it clear, keep it simple and keep it defined. This is a competency-based job description. So what is a competency-based job description. You can see it there on your screens. It's a description which focuses more on the knowledge, the skills and abilities needed to accomplish the responsibilities of the job rather than just the responsibilities themselves. And it ultimately provides a framework to assess a candidate's ability to do the job. Okay. So when we look at the framework, I've been asked this before, what, what do we mean when you actually say the framework of the job? Well, you know, you're talking again, the knowledge, the skills and the abilities. So what are the essential and what are the core functions of the job? These are the things that absolutely have to be done by the candidate. That's first and foremost. What are the non-core tasks of the job? You know, these are desirable. These are non-essential things. These are things that ultimately might be able to be done or could be done by somebody else within the, within the organization. What are the main skills that are needed to do the role? You know, do you have to have experience in a certain area? And again, what are the core skills that are needed and what are the more desirable skills? What is the physical environment um, like? You know, I, I think when you're actually doing a, a good job description, I think more and more organizations should actually note the buildings that you're in. I think it's very, very important. Note your physical environment. Note that your office is a Georgian building in Dublin too, with three floors above ground and one floor below ground, because that would say to somebody who may have, who may be a wheelchair user, for example, that look, maybe that's not a job that I can apply to because there may be accessibility issues, issues there. And what are the social conditions like? Again, this is something that I think you should always know. You know, this role does require, you know, high levels of teamwork on occasion. It does require deadlines that will have to be met. You know, there's no denying that, that some jobs do have very heavy levels of deadlines that do need to be met on occasion. And another thing I'd say as well is, you know, again, use plain English. You know, I've seen a lot of job ads that, um, you know, I've, I've had to really go for a coffee break nearly halfway through. They're so long. You know, don't use 10 words where you can use two. And I, I think it's just confusing for everybody, you know? So I think once you have your job description formed, the next thing that you do then is you're looking at job advertising. 
So when we're looking at job advertising, this is a key aspect to actually recruiting job seekers with a disability. And it's the first place where your job seeker will actually see the role that you have once it is made public. So the decision would be ultimately made at this point, whether, whether or not someone's going to reply for a role, you know? So there's, I think I have seven points here on what we actually do to actually um, ensure that you are being inclusive when it comes to the job advertising process. And the first is where do you choose to advertise your role? You know, a lot of job seekers with disabilities, they may be disillusioned with the traditional hiring routes. So again, look beyond the traditional jobs boards and maybe linking with a lot of NGOs in that regard. And this brings us on to the second point that are you linking in with, with NGOs, which are non-governmental organizations? There's a lot of organizations out there, such as Employability Service. You know, there's 24 of them nationally. There, there's right from the Kerry office where I used to work to the Dublin North office right around the country. Really, really good organizations with a big talent pool of candidates who are all there and willing to actually look for employers. So you've got the Open Doors Initiative, you Special Eastern. You know, you've got all of these organizations have talent pools of capable and willing potential employees. So link in with them, get online, see what NGOs shoot you suit your job description and forward it onto them. Do you have a nominated point of contact for disability related queries? You know, is there somebody that you've actually mentioned on the thing that if you have a disability and you have specific queries related to the role, you know, you can contact this person. And this gives the job seeker with a disability confidence that there's an understanding of their potential needs. Can you provide information about the role in alternative formats? Again, you know, can you make it material available and easy to read if it is requested of you? For somebody, for example, if somebody has an intellectual disability and you should ensure images and non-text items always have text alternatives. You know, I, I think as well, when you're advertising on social media and online, you know, always ensure that your images have alternative text. And if you're doing this, you know, make sure that you do it properly and you don't need to leave it up to the, uh, the computer to generate. You know, for example, a man sitting down smiling at two people, that's what the computer might generate. But, you know, spend one minute and write the alt text yourself. You know, see a man in a formal suit sitting in an interview setting, be greeted warmly by interviewers. The interviewers are a man and a woman and they're both dressed casually. You're not disabling somebody who's blind by the way that you're by not including them in a, in a genuine uh, inclusive um, visual description. Ensure automated scanning software doesn't discriminate against people with disabilities. And again, for those of you who aren't aware, you know, a lot of larger organizations, they use computer software to scan CVs. And I think it's about 98% of Fortune 500 companies, these, these use automatic scanning software or automated scanning software. So these processes, they're, they're a natural barrier to many disabled people. You know, work experience gaps, uh, employment gaps, uh, maybe alternative routes to education and alternative routes to employment. So these are part and parcel for many people with disabilities who, again, could be equally as capable as anybody else, but just might have followed a non-traditional route to employment and they're actually kind of scanned out of the actual process by these scanning softwares. Um, online applications and application forms, you know, is there a timeout function? Um, when I was working with employability down in Kerry, I remember I was working with two candidates who were on Clarny, and I mean, these two people were ideally suited to one job, which was being advertised by a very well-known, very large Irish employer, but they had a, a very quick timeout function in the job. And the level of frustration that these two people had, that they, that they couldn't actually fill out the, the, um, the actual um, application form in time, because it kept timing out. So ultimately what happens in a process like that, if they don't have the assistance of some, some organization like employability, is they, not only do the job seekers lose out, but maybe the organization is losing out on two of the best people that they could actually get for their job. So extending your timeout function or not having one in that regard would be a lot more applicable. And finally, do you demonstrate inclusion by having an equality statement on your job advertisement and uh, job advertisements? And the reality is that I think this simply isn't done by a lot of Irish job advertisers. And I'm going to show you why I know this now. So last year in um, Q3 2020, Ability Focus, we did a detailed analysis of 550 different job advertisements on three Irish jobs websites, um, as I said, through Q3 2020. We looked at, as I said, 550 separate companies. So the analysis was broken into three separate areas. With private sector advertising, when it came to jobs, with public sector, with nonprofit, with social enterprise, and we had charity, um, our jobs as well. And in the third area was recruitment agency advertising. So every industry was analyzed right across the board. You know, it was completely indiscriminate. We looked at retail advertising, legal jobs, pharmaceutical jobs, finance jobs, human resources jobs, absolutely everything. And it was jobs right across just the Republic of Ireland were looked, looked at. And we looked at all companies from, you know, large international blue chip organizations to, you know, small family business out in West Kerry, you know, to small family owned businesses. 
And the purpose of this was to assess what level of emphasis was placed by Irish companies or companies advertising in Ireland in demonstrating a commitment to equal opportunity and diversity when they, when they advertise jobs. So the job ads were viewed for each of the following. And the first one was your standard equality statement, which says, you know, we're an equal opportunity employer. The second one was equality statements, which contain a basic reference to welcoming applicants from diverse groups. So, you know, this would say something like, um, we, wel we welcome applicants from um, all backgrounds and we don't discriminate based on gender, disability, race, sexual orientation. The third one were equality statements, which placed a really detailed emphasis on welcoming diversity and inclusion. You know, this was like at Company X, we appreciate the true value that people from all backgrounds bring. We st strongly believe in um, that uh, diversity creates a workforce truly reflective of society. We actively encourage applicants from people with all backgrounds, something very warm, very welcoming, very empathetic. The fourth one was the one I really wanted to look for here, which was equality statements with a mention of providing accommodations for job seekers with disabilities, which would have said something like, if you have a disability and if you require any accommodations to be made for your job application, just please let us know, we'd be happy to assist. And the fifth one was a job ads that on the job ad themselves had no reference anywhere to even the basic equal opportunity statement, let alone welcoming diversity or accommodating disabilities. So we looked at the private sector. So we looked at 350 separate employers in the private sector advertising all over Ireland. And we found that only 5% of 350 jobs advertising in Ireland had noted that they were an equal opportunity employer. 10% had a basic diversity statement. 6% had a detailed diversity statement. And only 4% of 350 jobs advertised in Ireland had a mention that if you had a disability and needed accommodations, let us know and we'd be happy to help you. And 75% of jobs advertised did not even have the most basic reference to say that we are an equal opportunity employer in 2020. Okay, and this is all the private sector organizations. So we looked at 100 jobs in the public sector. So I have this on as public sector, but it was public sector, social enterprise, charity, nonprofit. And this, this was actually quite surprising because I thought, I thought it would have been a lot, a, lot, a lot heavier when it came to disability accommodations noted. But there was 24% um, of these employers out of 100 had an equal opportunity employer statement. 3% had a basic diversity statement. Um, 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 sorry, 10% had a detailed diversity statement. And again, only 4% of 100 jobs had disability accommodations noted. And almost 60% of jobs in the public sector, um, nonprofit, charity, and social enterprise, out of 100 jobs that we looked at, had no reference anywhere to even equality or diversity. And in the final sector that we looked at, we looked at 100 separate recruitment agencies in Ireland. And not one single agency that I came across. So we looked at 100 completely separate agencies and we just picked 100 jobs that they had and looked at each one of them individually. And not a single agency that I came across over a three month period had even the basic equal opportunity statements written at the end of a job ad. This was in Q3 2020. Now I'm not saying there aren't agencies out there who were doing this at the time and who are doing it now. I'm sure there are, but I just didn't come across them when I did this. You know, I think recruiters are in an incredibly privileged position of offering and offering and creating opportunity for people with disabilities. You know, the first point of contact for somebody with a disability when they go looking for a job, and when they actually see a job advertised on behalf of a client, and there's no reference to equal opportunity, welcoming diversity, let alone having any form of disability accommodation. I think that kind of sets it off on the wrong tone. Um, one key thing to know is that you know, for clients who actually engage recruitment agencies. You know, always remember that the recruiter who interviews on your behalf, that's the first point of contact in representing you as an organization. And I'm sure you want job seekers to know that you are an equal opportunity employer. So I think it would be a really, really good thing if, if one thing to come from this today is that recruitment agencies and clients start really having a very good conversation about the, how they want to be represented in job advertising. And if you start having these conversations, then you start changing the narrative for the recruitment industry and showing that disability is very much welcome within the industry and disability is very much accepted. So what are the key kind of takeaways when it comes to this? Well, there's a significant lack of equal opportunity statements from organizations right across Ireland. Job ads should always have an equal opportunity or employer statement. I really think they should. I think it's a very, very important thing to actually put in. Clients should always encourage every recruitment agency you partner with to display an equal opportunity as a statement. You know, remember that they're representing you, your core values, your organizational belief system. And if you're an organization which is inclusive of disability, then you should, you know, always let your recruitment agency know that, look, we are very important because they are the first point of contact for a job seeker with a disability. And disability awareness training, it should be completed by absolutely everybody who interviews job seekers. 
you know, it, it would be the easiest thing in the world to stick on a tagline for somebody in management to say, right, listen, lads, we need to uh, we need to put an equal opportunity employer statement at the end of all of our job, jobs and we'd be in trouble. Um, you know, that's the easy thing to do. But, you know, it, there's no point in doing that if the people who are interviewing, if the human resources team, if the management, if the company owner don't know anything around disability. And that's why this type of training is so important. So once you've done your job advertising and somebody's actually hopefully finally made it to the interview stage, we're going to look at a few points here. And I think, you know, by having an appropriate equal opportunity statement and by being an inclusive organization up to this point, you've hopefully demonstrated an inclusive nature and job seekers with a disability will hopefully you may have notified you of a disability or of an accommodation if it is needed. And you're now, as we said, you're now at the actual interview stage in itself. So I'm going to give you a few kind of key points here in this regard. And the first is that the main purpose of an interview is to determine whether the candidate has the skills to do the core aspects to the job. You know, remember, it's important to differentiate between the core duties and the non-core tasks or the essential aspects and the desirable aspects to any job. And I always think that you should really be focusing just on the core aspects of the job. Everything after that can be an add-on. Competency-based interview approaches, as we saw earlier on, you know, these are very important as they focus on the ability, not on the disability. And like earlier, you know, competency-based, it's focused on knowledge and skills and abilities. So again, stick to the job description and the requirements of the role in this regard. If you're asking, you know, asking somebody with a disability to demonstrate how they would do certain aspects of a role during an interview is absolutely fine once that same question is asked of all candidates. So again, this is key, you know, keep your job description at hand. And, you know, when you're interviewing somebody with a disability, you can ask them how they would do certain aspects or certain tasks of the role, as long as you're asking that of everybody else. You know, you can't point out a disability and just ask, how, I know I see that you have a disability X, how would you do this role? But you can say, you know, these are the tasks. Can you kind of run through these three or four things and just explain how you do them, as long as you're asking that of everybody that you interview. Assessment of a disabled person should only ever occur with reasonable accommodations factored in. So for those of you who don't know very, very quickly, reasonable accommodations, they refer to modifications which would allow a person with a disability to take up employment um, and the type of accommodations required, these can vary hugely and it varies hugely depending on the type of the disability. Um, it can include anything. It's very, very hugely wide ranging from the adaptation of the workplace and the working equipment, the changing of working hours, um, remote working, um, changing of working times, time off for relevant appointments would be a very big one as well. When you're interviewing, factor in three key things. You know, you're factoring in the person, whether or not you feel that person is a good fit for my company, whether or not you like them, if you think, you know, they'll get on with everybody else in the team, if they're going to be a good fit. You're factoring in their skill set and their experience, but you're also factoring in any necessary accommodations which may be made. You know, you can't just meet or interview somebody with a disability and, uh, and simply presume or, or make a judgment yourself as to their capabilities of the job without knowing how they would do a job with accommodations in place. You know, remember disabled people, that they're experts in their disability. And, you know, if they're turning up for an interview with you and if they're saying, if you're asking them, how would you do this job? Can you explain how you would do this, this, this particular task? If they don't know, then maybe they're just not the right person for the job. Everybody needs to do the research ahead of an interview. So somebody who's a disability, they're an expert in their disability. They should have done the, the research, providing you with a clear job description, and they should be able to tell you how they can get do any task that is assigned. The candidate's ability should only ever be assessed as well by always asking job-related questions only. You know, you wouldn't... Um, you, you wouldn't ask a woman um, how, how she can do this job without she has three kids. You know, this isn't the 1970s. Uh, you know, so, you know, you shouldn't point out a disability and ask, how can you do a job? I see mobility issues. How can you do this job? You can't do that. But you can, again, ask, how would you do this job with, or do these particular core tasks of this job? A detailed job description as well is absolutely key to assuring an effective interview. This is vital. You know, always stick to the job description and always ask questions just related to the job description. And it's very good when both interviewer and interviewee have the job descriptions. So that's your kind of your, I suppose, kind of your, your standard interview process that we're looking at and some tips for actually ensuring a more equal or equitable interview. But the reality is for some people with disabilities, you know, the, the standard interview process, it, it just doesn't work. You know, it's just not agreeable. And not everybody's suited to the traditional interview format. If you think of many people who are autistic, you know, they might struggle with an interview system which, which favors certain or expected social norms or, Somebody who's generalized anxiety disorder could be an exceptional IT technician, but they might really struggle in a very intense 30 minute interview. So you've got four, I'm gonna look at four very quick ones here. You've remote interviews. Now have proof of concept. 
you know, remote interviewing, it absolutely can be done and keep this going after the pandemic ends. Get offer it to, to people with disabilities, give them the opportunity to remote interview because that might be a lot easier than asking somebody to make their way into the IFSC at, at nine o'clock on a Monday morning for an interview. You know, so, you know, when you actually think of uh, the, 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 the other options, we've got practical interviews. So this is kind of observe and assess. So somebody might have a speech impediment or a speech impairment or somebody might be deaf. And they might have difficulty in communicating in an interview, but that person might be able to design or shape or create in a manner better than any fast talker. You know, work sampling is another very big one. And this is something we did a huge amount with employability. You know, some people with disabilities, they might take time to acclimatize. So giving them a little bit of time to actually come on site and to do a little bit of work, to actually get to know the team and to show you their levels of skills and their level of capability is very important. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, the, like, the, definitely the best one, you know, by far, the most commonly used one traditionally is work experience programs. And um, these are invaluable, I really do think, in sourcing employment for people with disabilities. If you look at AHEAD, um, they've had a fantastic program. It's called the WAN program, which is Willing, Enable, and, Men Willing, Able, Able and Mentoring. Um, you know, they work with a lot of large organizations in creating and giving opportunity to third level graduates who actually want to come on site and do a number of work experience. And a lot of the time that will turn into a full time employment or part time employment. Um, employability, so many jobs of people who work with the employability service are gotten through work experience programs. It's a fantastic initiative and what it is is somebody comes on site and they work with you for maybe a month they show you exactly what it is and in many cases that will lead to full-time or part-time employment as well and at the very very least at the very worst somebody gets some work experience on their cv so remembering you know the main disabling factor in, in the lives of so many job seekers with impairments and disabilities it's the recruitment process you know we really can just adjust it by and make it a little bit easier by giving the you know greater consideration to people with disabilities so now that somebody's um you, you made you've made the hire and uh, somebody started working and uh, just some very very quick points for you to actually know with regards to actually starting a job for somebody with disabilities and I think too often you know people get jobs and they start working and they don't work out because the levels of support aren't given to them you know once they've actually started the job and I think this is a really really key thing this is what's called supported employment in many ways so the levels of support and accommodations if any you know which are required will vary hugely depending on the actual disability themselves as well. So again, there's no point to me sitting here and saying, you know, these are the things that you should do because disability, it's hugely diverse. And the needs of one employee who's cerebral palsy would be very different to the needs of another employee who has multiple sclerosis. So talk to the person, you know, get open channels of communication going. Ensure you fully involve the person with the disability when you're assessing suitable accommodations. Again, communicate. You know, somebody who has a disability, you know, they're, they're experts in their disability, but you're the expert of your business. So have a conversation, you know, how you start communicating, have a discussion and see what accommodations might need to be made or might need to be made and then start looking at putting them in place. Implement reasonable accommodation passports. This is something that was launched in 2019 by IBEC. Um, really, really good initiative. I know Bank of Ireland have reasonable accommodation passports and there's a few other um, organisations who are doing them. It's basically a document which logs accommodations that are needed at the very start. You know, if somebody starts employee uh, in employment or if they, um, are, if they acquire a disability and it's ultimately kept by that person if they move on to another department or if they have a new manager, that they're not sitting down every six months and explaining to an oil, a new employer or a new manager, you know, what they need. They ultimately have a document which is signed, looked at and agreed upon. And, um, you know, it, it stops them kind of explaining themselves on a consistent basis. Assign a point of contact for the new employee, you know, really important as well. If there's somebody, you know, who has any, any one of a number of disabilities, sometimes having a point of contact, someone that almost mentors them on site, that they can go to if they need any accommodations. It mightn't have to be the direct line manager. It could be a colleague. But there may be somebody themselves who has a good knowledge or a good understanding of disability. That would be very, very important. And that can support them on site as, as a supportive employee. Um, in some cases, inviting the employee on site uh, prior to starting employment is, is really important to ensure that there's no accessibility issues. I've heard stories before of somebody who turns up day one, they can't get into the building or they get into the building, they realize the desk is too, too high or they realize that the computer, they can't access their computer. So inviting somebody on site for a run through is really, really important. Reviewing your job description and ensuring that the core tasks and the non-core duties can be completed as well. You know, this is very, very important as well, because you're actually knowing that they're not going to you're not going to be asking somebody to do something which they've already stated they, they, they would struggle to do. And finally, never assume, you know, never assume that you know what somebody needs. Never assume that, you know, because they have this disability, that this is going to be what they're going to need because you looked it up on the Internet. You know, it's really important. Again, have that conversation and communicate. So 
now that we've looked at that 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 kind of level and somebody's actually started um you know working for you i think we're kind of going to bring it back and this is we're going to finish up very quickly by looking at disclosure and this is this is a particularly important area for a lot of irish job seekers with disabilities and for those interviewing them as well it's an intensely competitive environment out there when it comes to work and disclosure really really can be a very very difficult decision so it's up to the individual themselves with a disability whether or not they want to disclose there's never a legal obligation to disclose a disability if it is not relevant to the role. So if the disability might impact on the safety of the candidate or the safety of the workplace, only then really should it be disclosed unless that person themselves wants to disclose it. Many disabled people will do a cost benefit analysis of disclosure and a disability positive culture is absolutely key here to promoting disclosure. Create opportunity for disclosure again during the recruitment process. This is why having an inclusive recruitment process is so important. You know, this is why equality statements and mentions of reasonable accommodations are important. Um, this is why showing that like point number one, that a culture of disability inclusion is really important. If you're constantly referring to disability, if you're constantly referring to inclusion of disability, then you're creating many opportunities, especially throughout the recruitment process for somebody to share this information with you. Designate a person with who the disability can be disclosed. So again, if you're saying, you know, when, when somebody starts um, working for you and or somebody's actually doing the recruitment process, by having one nominated point of contact, somebody can actually share this information and they can have a conversation about their actual disability if needs be. And to finish off, confidentiality and transparency is absolutely key. You know, it's very important that you let people know that any information they show you is treated in the strictest of confidence and show them the steps that are taken to ensure confidentiality. So that's just some very quick pointers on, on how to be inclusive during the recruitment process. Again, I think we could have delved a lot deeper, but you know, we're already on nearly quarter three. So I wanted to just not show you the full inclusive rec recruitment process. I wanted to finish up and use a few minutes to show you why you should have a more inclusive recruitment process as well. So what are the benefits to being more inclusive of disability? Um, just a point to notice here actually as well, if you look at the picture, I was going on about visual representation of disability earlier on. And uh, I think this is a really good one. You know, you're, you're showing disability as being included, but you're not showing it as front and center. I think, you know, again, traditionally too many visual representations of disability would show a person with a disability maybe at the front of the picture and there's a bunch of people standing around giving a thumbs up and a smile or high-fiving. Um, you know, this, we're in 2021, we've moved on from that now. Show, show it as an inclusion, show somebody working, but you don't have to worry too much about it, literally putting the person at the front of the, the picture to show a level of inclusion. This is a more modern, I think, and a more progressive level of disability inclusion when it comes to visual representation. And this is another one here. Um, it's just somebody working with a, with a very subtle um, uh, no, no, notification of disability there. Um, so the first one is increased innovation. So when you're looking at benefits to being an inclusive organization, I'm gonna show you six of them here. So people with disabilities, they're very resilient. You know, whether somebody's born with a disability or whether they acquire it, um, the ability to adapt, I think, is a consequence of the situation. They develop skills such as persistence and forethought and problem solving and very much adaptability. And like these are all key elements to innovation. So every company benefits from innovators. So by hiring disabled people, you're naturally going to have innovators within your organization. You're going to have improved shareholder value. You know, so surveys continually demonstrate that organizations who hire people with disabilities and place an emphasis on inclusion, that they actually report continual return on investments. In the UK, a survey was done in 2019, which showed that a one pound investment in disability can yield as much as a 65 pound return. And now as well, and some of you might've seen more and more companies um, are actually having company culture is monitored by regulators. So remember diversity, that could be quite easy to do, but it's inclusion, this is the hard part. Improved productivity. So many people who would in many cases, you know, never get past that initial recruitment process. They're now being extremely productive members of staff. If you look at many people who are autistic, you know, they could be really talented in their chosen area, but they might struggle with a traditional interview. As we said earlier on, somebody who may have anxiety or mental health issue, you know, they might struggle with the traditional interview process, but they may be fantastic workers. So disabled people are also less likely to take sick leave. They commit more to employers. And they're also more loyal, according to a number of surveys from the United Kingdom. Three more quick examples of how to be a benefit, uh, benefits to being an inclusive organization. The next one here is improved market share. So there's, there's 690,000 people who are living in Ireland who have a disability. So it's not just the 690,000 people. You're talking them, you're talking their husbands, their wives, their kids, their friends, their colleagues, their social circles. 
So by including disability, you're not opening up, you're opening up to not just the 690,000 people who have a disability, you're opening up to all of their friends in the social circuits. If you think of a restaurant that is disability inclusive, you know, they're not going to have one person with a disability coming on site to eat in their own generally. They might have a group of six. So it makes good business sense to be, to be a more inclusive organization. You've enhanced reputation. A 2017 survey, which was undertaken over in the United States, showed that 66% of customers, they're more likely to purchase goods and services which feature disability in their advertising. So there's 1.3 billion people worldwide that have a disability. That's close to 20% of the world's population. Yet disability makes up, point, I think it's 0.02% of all advertising and marketing. So it's about being more inclusive, you know, in your advertising, you will enhance your reputation. And generally people do look much more favorably on organizations who include disability in all forms. And finally, the one that we're here to talk about today, you know, inclusive recruitment, you're increasing your talent pipeline. There's neurodiverse talented, there's talented people who can work remotely now. You know, somebody might be a fantastic administrator for your organization, but they might struggle to get from Navin to Dublin city center. You know, they might be a very talented accountant, but they might struggle to get from Dingle to Tralee, but they can still do their jobs. So if you're not considering an estimated 690,000 people with a disability when you're looking to recruit, then I think that's a lot of people who are excluded from your talent pool. So we're going to finish up and we're going to look at five very quick kind of summarized positive action measures. So again, for those of you who don't know, a positive action measure, it's a measure which goes beyond the prohibition of discrimination and it allows for differential treatment for people with disabilities so that they can achieve equality. So the first one is linking in with disability employment support services. You know, again, organizations like employability, you have ability at work down in Cork, um, you have all of these ability programs, you have Special Eastern. In open Doors Initiative, there's so many out there, so many good organizations and so many winning places that can actually give you a very good talent pool of disabilities, of people with disabilities. You have internships and work experience programs. Again, you know, again, the, the employability work experience programs, but the AHEAD, the winning enabling mentoring programs, there's so many of them out there. So it's about linking in, looking, see what's local to you and what's most relevant to your organization and getting that level of support. You have equality statements in job advertising, including a mention of reasonable accommodations. I really do think that every organization should be including at the end of the job. You know, if you have a disability and if you need supports, let us know. If you need supports to interview, let us know and we'd be happy to assist. I think that's something that's quite easily done. Government grants for the employment of people with disabilities. You know, there's, there's so many. We, we could spend a few more slides doing this, but I, I was saying earlier on, I, I, just, I simply didn't have the time to fit it in. Um, you have the job interview interpreter grant, you have the workplace equipment adaptation grant, you have employee retention grants. You have a thing called the wage subsidy scheme, which gives a rebate of five euro thirty back per hour for every hour that somebody with a disability works, providing there's a shortfall in productivity. That's up to 10,000 euro a year grant rebate. So there's so many of them there, so many government grants. It's just about looking at the De Department of Social Protection website or citizens information and getting that information. And finally, you know, disability awareness training. This is this is what we do and this is what I really believe that, you know, that there's almost no point in, in, in doing any of these other things until you've trained your staff in disability awareness. There's no point in turning on to the team and saying, I have this great idea. We're going to link in with this organization. Let's, let's go and get these grants and start putting equality statements in our job advertising. If, if your colleagues and your managers and everybody else doesn't have a clue what disability is. So by training your staff in disability, you're creating a much greater awareness of what disability is as well as what it is not. Um, one more thing to note, actually, when we're looking at the disability awareness training, it, it's actually tied in with the government grants, is that there is a thing called the disability awareness support scheme. So for any private sector organizations who are tuning in today, who are considering getting disability awareness training, there's a government grant that covers 90% of the cost of the training. So whether you're a recruitment agency, whether you're a retailer or whether you work in, in construction, if you want to train a number of your staff, and if the cost of that ends up being, let's say, for example, a thousand euros around figure, you can apply for the DASS grant. And if it is approved, you will end up only paying 100 euros to train all of your staff in disability awareness training. So last slide we're going to look at here. And what we're going, I suppose the one thing I'm going to say to everybody is, you know, let's hopefully try and change our perceptions of disability. You know, we change the narrative when it comes to employment and when it comes to recruitment. And let's focus on the ability, not the disability. And, People with disabilities, you know, the recruiters, their managers, their accountants, teachers, their retail workers and admin workers. You know, if you actually look at this picture here, the woman on the left hand side of the red glasses, you know, she could have bipolar disorder. The man behind her could be deaf. The woman in the beige jacket could have MS and the next woman could have an intellectual disability. But all of them are working because all of them have been given equal opportunity or equitable opportunities of employment. And I just want to say that, you know, by, by being inclusive, you know, you're not only creating opportunity for job seekers who have job disabilities. You're also creating opportunity for yourself, for your organization. 
So that's it. That, that's my thing. Pretty much uh, bang on the, with, with the five minutes to go. Um, before I, I, I do a shameless plug here, Christabel, if that's okay. And so ultimately, I suppose this is what we do for organizations. We do disability awareness training. So if there's anybody tuning in today who's in either the public sector or the private sector, and you are looking at doing disability awareness training, you know, we, we've a, a variety of programs that we do. Our main one is the, the live online disability awareness training. It's four one hour sessions delivered exactly in this kind of format. Um, we usually deliver it over two mornings um, or over maybe four one hour sessions. And this is really the program that I think everybody should be doing. But we also do customized training, uh, maybe an hour long, hour and a half long, two, three hours long, whatever suits. Um, and again, if there's any individuals tuning in who, you know, feel just you yourself want to do training or, you know, a small group of five or ten of you from an organization want to do training. We do we do the same program, which is delivered um, usually in the first or maybe the first and third um, week of every month. So it's a public, it's open to members of the public. So you can just let us know. We can add your name to the participant list. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, and if you have any questions, this is my email is there, my phone number is there, and you can shoot me off um, any questions afterwards. So I'll hand you back to Christopher. Thanks very much, Stephen. That was absolutely brilliant. A really, really informative session. And I can even see here from the chat box that people have found the information you shared today very useful. So for more information about Employers for Change and the events that we will be holding throughout the course of the year, you can visit employersforchange.ie or follow us on LinkedIn or on Twitter.